Hey guys, welcome back to Nifty Invest. In the realm of economic analysis, Rafi Farber has become a prominent voice, offering unique perspectives on the intricacies of the financial system. In one of his recent videos, he delves into the labyrinth of treasury auctions, reverse repos, and the ominous shadow of fiscal dominance. This video serves as a comprehensive breakdown of his insights, providing a bird's eye view of the upcoming challenges in the financial landscape. Farber starts by directing our attention to the Treasury Direct Government website, a repository of information on upcoming and recently concluded Treasury auctions. Focusing on the 13-week, 26-week, 52-week and 42-day CMB cash management bills, Farber notes that these bills, despite their technical differences, represent short-term debt with near-record issuances. The imminent auctions on the 27th and 28th, totaling a staggering amount, prompt Farber to highlight the near-record issuances for each maturity. He compares these figures to historical records, pointing out that the 13-week and 26-week bills are approaching all-time highs. The looming question is whether the market possesses enough available dollars to bid on these unprecedented amounts. Don't forget to like and subscribe if you enjoyed the content we do here on this channel. Let's get right into the video. We have here open the treasurydirect.gov website, um, which is all the treasury all the treasury auctions that are upcoming and that have just ended. So if you look at the 13 week, 26 week, 52 week and 42 day CMB, these are all bills. The 42 day is technically a CMB. It's a different kind of thing, but it's short term debt. So it's, it's practically the same thing. Uh, if you look at the total here, it's like 75 plus 68 plus 44 plus 70 all on the 27th and 28th uh that that will take place so i think these are these are all near record uh near record issuances for each of these maturities i think uh, the 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 record for 13 week was like 80 billion and the record for 26 was like 70 billion or something they're, they're all like right there like almost records and if you add on to that the amount of debt that's that's uh still outstanding and this kind of fits together in the, in the bills category, I think it's like 5.5 trillion. But when you think about it, the higher debt issuance is already outstanding on the bills, the higher these auctions are going to have to be because what pays down the past, what pays down that balance is new bills auctions. That's, they go to pay themselves. That's the Ponzi. Um, that, that's like the inner eye of the hurricane Ponzi. It spins really, really quickly. So the, the, the more is outstanding, the more auctions are going to have to be. And you see that right here. In addition to that, um, and what's this total? I, mean, I don't want to do the math on it. It's 13, it's like two, 200 something billion dollars, whatever it is. Yeah. And then you have all this uh, also on the 27th and 28th, another 54 billion plus 55 billion plus 39 billion. That's another, what, 140 billion? Yeah, 150 billion. 50 billion, yeah. So, I mean, these 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 amounts are not, not only just are they insane, but they are they're challenging I would say the amount of dollars actually available to bid on them. I don't, I can't, I don't, I don't know how to make the calculation. Are these amount of dollars even available in the first place? Um, I mean, technically they are because they're in the reverse repo. There's enough in the reverse repo to fund all of this stuff. Um, but then it's like how much of that is, is dedicated to something else. I mean, it, we don't know these answers because we're outside the system. We're not in it. We're just looking at a bird's eye view. So there's only so much that we know. Um, but if you wanted me to talk about the reverse repos, I can open that tab. Yeah, that's down to almost 930, isn't it? Billion. Yeah. So this is uh, the reverse repos tab. We're at 930 billion, right? And if you look at the, the yearly chart, we're at, we're at a pretty steady slope here since June. It's quickened a little bit and we've we've got to a low of uh, what was it 912 billion last week and now we've been steady for a week um that's probably because there haven't been uh so many auctions that happened this week and they're happening next week but next week when we see these flood of auctions on 27 the 28th we should see another drop here that's that's what's going to happen this will keep going until it hits zero and when it hits zero uh the question is what happens then i mean it, people have asked me uh, we didn't need reverse repos before, and they only came into existence in a big way in 2021. That's true. And like, so what funded treasury auctions before that? And, and the question is the fractional reserve system, which functions 
when interest rates are low enough to encourage new loans, right? The banks create money through loaning and that's fractional reserve. And when they create new money, they have extra money and they can spend it on treasury auctions or whatever and get the yield. But when interest rates are as high as they are now and the money supply is shrinking anyway because they can't make new loans because interest rates are too high to make new loans, then they don't have extra money to pay to buy treasuries. They have to take from the reverse repo. So when it when it runs out, like who's who's going to bid? Like what what's going to happen? I think the answer is like, there's gonna there's not gonna be enough bids, and the treasury auction is gonna one treasury auction is gonna fail at some point, and then the treasury market is not gonna know what to do, and the Fed's gonna have to come in and and buy things directly, and then the dollar is just gonna go through the floor in a matter of days or weeks. Faber then pivots to the reverse repo market, currently standing at almost nine nine hundred thirty billion. Analyzing the steady slope in the yearly chart since June, he speculates on the potential implications of the reverse repo market hitting zero. This leads to a critical question. What happens when the reverse repos run out and where will the funds for treasury auctions come from? Faber explores the intricacies of the fractional reserve system, emphasizing that as interest rates rise and the money supply shrinks, banks may struggle to fund treasury auctions. The concern is that with high debt issuance and outstanding balances, there might not be enough bids, leading to the potential failure of a treasury auction. If you're within a fiat system that has to keep pyramiding, then if you stop the pyramid, the whole Ponzi scheme collapses. And that's what he's saying. He's like, if you don't spend this money, the the, the Keynesian, uh, um, what's it called? The Ponzi scheme, the, the, the Ponzi scheme is going to collapse. And that's essentially what he's saying. And he's right. Uh, so you can't have responsible spending within a fiat system. You have to make it a sound money system and then you can have responsible spending. It's like you can't do one without the other. It doesn't work. Right? It just it just leads to the collapse of the pyramid, which is what we want. And we understand that there's consequences and we get it. And we're not saying bad things aren't going to happen. They're going to happen, but we're saying they have to happen anyway. Um, and so about fiscal dominance, uh, it just it, technically what it means is like the, the Keynesian C2 two engines to the economy, monetary and fiscal policy. Monetary policy is what the central bank does and fiscal policy is what the, the parliament or the Congress or whatever you want to call it does, House of Commons. Uh, so fiscal dominance is a term where it says that monetary policy no longer can control anything and the fiscal wing of, of, of the economy takes over. It's like whatever they do, that's what the market follows. So fiscal dominance is when the market only cares about government spending. And if they see that government spending is way too much, they'll just dump dollars. And it doesn't matter what the central bank does. So then they come up with all these equations about when it happens and that's all BS. But uh, it's 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 basically, it's gonna happen. Uh, what they're talking about functionally is like what happened in the late seventies and eighties when the, when the central bank, when the Fed and other central banks almost lost control of the entire thing, but they just got control of it at the end. Um, but it, colloquially, how we say it is when when nobody cares about what the central bank does anywhere, they're just dumping the currency. That's fiscal dominance, and they have their own academic way of saying it, but we've been saying it for years. So yeah, if they're saying it's going to happen now, it's going to happen soon. I hope it'll be in 2024. I see that there are there's a lot of triggers that could be pulled in 2024 that could make it happen. Um, but again, I mean, this is it, it, I can't deny that this is wishful thinking on my part. Not in the sense that I don't think it's actually going to happen. I'm saying I, I hope it will happen and it, not because I want there to be a collapse, but like people have to understand and internalize like when you do like in the spiritual and when you do something wrong, when you commit a sin, when you commit murder or you steal, eventually you will pay it back either in this world or the next. And if you steal, everyone's going to pay back your theft here. It's going to happen. The concept of fiscal dominance takes center stage in Faber's analysis. He explains how, in a scenario where government spending becomes the primary market driver, monetary policy loses its effectiveness. Faber warns that if fiscal dominance takes hold, the market may only care about government spending, potentially triggering a collapse. Faber candidly expresses his desire for a collapse sooner rather than later, acknowledging the inevitable consequences of systemic theft since the 1930s. He ties this wish to the ongoing conflicts globally, emphasizing the urgency of resolving geopolitical issues intertwined with economic instability. Like the, that's that's the rule of the universe. So we've been stealing from each other systematically since the 1930s, all of humanity. And all of that theft is going to be t paid for. There's nothing you can do to stop it. Um, I just want it to be paid back sooner so that we can do less theft by the time it has to be paid back. So it'll be slightly less bad. So the longer it takes, the worse it's going to be. And that's just the inevitable truth of it.
Um, but in terms of why it's wishful thinking, because, you know, there's a war going on. There's like babies kidnapped, you know, by Hamas. And I don't know what is happening to them. There's women there. I don't know what's happening to them. I don't think we ever, I don't think that there's a deal or whatever. This is all nonsense, but the, they're not going to get out of there until America leaves and Israel can do what it needs to do, um, which I'm not going to talk about. Uh, because it will be too controversial, but yeah. but I, I want the collapse to happen because that's the only way this war is going to end, and then maybe we can get our people back. I see, I see a potential uh, trigger point at Feb something between February and, and April of this year um, when the reverse repos run out. I would be very surprised. It's not impossible. Maybe there's something I don't know about, but I would be very surprised if the reverse repos run out and nothing happens to the bond market. Um, but when something does happen, I don't think it's going to be gradual and they're not going to be able to save it this time. Um, they'll be able to save it nominally, but once the Fed moves in again and we see how much they have to move in, uh, I think that'll be that'll be the end and it'll come very quickly. There's not going to be a time, oh, oh, okay, well, I guess they run out now and now's the time to buy gold and silver and you'll have a few weeks to get it at stable prices and then everything will be fine. It's not going to be that way. It's going to be panic. Yeah. Um, so, so get what you need before the panic happens when people are still making fun of us. Uh, and um, and there was one thing I wanted to say about about um, the foreigners not wanting um, treasuries. Well, if you think about it this way, it's not like someone on the top is making a decision in China saying we're not going to buy any treasuries anymore, and let's let's do a board meeting and then they decide they're not going to do it. I think what's it happens more organically, like the prices in America become higher and higher and higher, and then and 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 then people can't afford it, so they don't buy anymore. So P Americans get poorer and then the trade deficit starts to balance because they're not importing as much from China and then they don't have as much tre as much dollars to reinvest in the treasury so they stop doing it right and and then once they stop doing it there's no more foreign demand and then everything collapses so it's like the prices in America and the the foreign demand for treasuries they kind of like yin and yang it's, yeah. it's sort of like a natural thing so yeah. that all comes to an end and then the dollar collapses